You're listening to a Pop House Network podcast for developers by developers. Hey, hello and welcome to the Stacked Podcast, episode number 67, recorded on July 28th, 2023. Uh, my name is Kito Man, and I'm here with my co host, Daniel Inahosa. Hey, Dano. Hey there, how's it going? And I am good. I am good. Uh, I think we've got a really cool episode ahead of us. Um, yeah, that's right. Do you, I'm trying to think of what, what's been going on lately. Well, Anything I, I met with this person named Kito Man. Oh, yeah. Last, yeah, last I heard week. about him. Last week, yes. Indeed. And, him. Yeah, cool, so cool we person. were both at, at UberCon, we Denver. We were both at UberCon, yeah. Denver, I was even Colorado. in your presentation or one of your presentations. Yeah, I was, I was, I was very honored to have you at, a, at one of my presentations, Dano. Yeah, so awesome. I, I had a presentation on uh, getting things done, which is a productivity methodology. I'm, I'm not with just the other pro- gang. I'm with the uh, Pomodoro Technique gang. So, but hey, they they work together. That, that's, that's the right. beauty about like methodologies. You can mix and match right. all you want. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. So that was a fun conference. Um, and well, it's getting there. Uh, I um I got the um. The totals, the, the max UberConf has been as uh, was 800, supposedly. Uh, but there were 300 at this one. Uh, it was far less last year. So I think I think conferences, we could use that as a bellwether. I think more and more conferences uh, are, are becoming in person. Um, the no fluff uh, UberConf uh, has uh, what we call hybrid. So we do talks on Zoom as well as in person. Uh, it used to be like Zoom would be like I'd have 25 people in my presentation and then five <laughs> there. But oh, know, wow. the, 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 wow. the script has flipped. So, uh, yeah, we're getting more uh, in, in-house. So, you know, other no fluff conferences are like uh, DevNexus. I know DevNexus is, you know, not quite there yet either, but, you know, more and more people are going. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's been a slow process, but honestly, I'm at this point very happy to <laughs> to get out of the house yeah, and go somewhere. Right. So, yep. cool, very cool. Anything else you've been up to? Nah, just <laughs> swimming and uh, swimming and walking dogs and programming and all that good stuff. All right, cool. Um, yeah, it's been a couple. Actually, it's been like a couple months since our last podcast. Um, but yeah, uh, so Josh and Ian can't be here, but they'll, they'll be here next time, hopefully. Um, and uh, I've just been doing the same stuff I always do. Uh, <laughs> uh, working on uh, Jakarta E documentation and um, uh, Java projects and stuff like that. So fun stuff. Sure. Um, all right, so without further ado, we've got a couple uh, awesome uh, guests with us today. Um, so I'll start with um, Frank Greco, who is the uh, founder of the New York Java uh, Users Group, or Java SIG. I don't know he's a founder. Um, yeah. Um, awesome. And a Java champion and, uh, and an all-around awesome guy that's been in the community forever. So welcome. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Welcome, man. I, feel she, I officially met him last year, even though I've been... You know, I, with the circuit, believe, I don't think we ever met. Yeah. You know, I, I have a, a like I used to live in New York and I remember going to the user group, but I didn't know you at the time. I was just like, oh, I just and I was like, wow, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> there's actually like, you know, it like you'd go and there'd be like, you know, over a hundred and something people. I'm like, wow, there's actually people showing up. So I, I think I know a little bit of history of uh uh New York uh, Java SIG. Was your first uh, opening presenter, like when you uh, when you first uh, the first the first episode <laughs> or the first meeting uh, was it Arthur Van Ha or was he it was one first? of the first ones. He wasn't the first, but he was in the first probably first year. Okay, Arthur. Yeah, we had a podcast where I, met, I mentioned Arthur Van Ha, and everyone's like, "Remember that one, Keto?" Everyone's like awkwardly silent, and I'm like, "Come on, Arthur Van Ha!" Mm-hmm. And I'm like, "Do you even look at the Java documentation?" <laughs> like you go to Java Lang object and you go to all the basic ones. Arthur Van Hoff is uh, is the name there. I thought he that was the first the, one. he wrote the Java compiler in Java. He was the first one to do that. Oh, interesting! Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Who was your he first also, one? He also created TiVo, the software TiVo. Really? Oh, really? Okay. Arthur. Wow. Yes. He's, he's done quite well. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Wow. Who you know, was your first one? Yeah, TiVo's great. Yeah. The first speaker. 
I mean, yeah. uh, you know what? Actually, I'd be interested to go back into the history of the Java thing later on uh, in, in the talk. And I think you'll find it uh, interesting. There's an interesting parable <laughs> part of the story. So, um, yeah. do you ever have Gosling? Uh, we did have Gosling for our 25th anniversary. Nice. Oh, nice. Took, took us 25 years to get him. <laughs> yeah. Keep trying. Persistence pays off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So we have another uh, awesome person with us. So uh, Zoran Severik who yeah. uh, is here as well. He's another Java champion um, and an AI uh, developer, entrepreneur, and researcher. Yes. <laughs> Hi, guys. Right. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Okay. Welcome. We're very happy to have you as well. Um, yeah. And you know, I realized when I when I I was looking you up to write the bio, or you know, get your bio information, I was like, wait a second, I I have we actually met? Like, I know I've seen you before. Have we met at a conference before? Yeah. Well, very likely, I've been visiting Java One for uh, some time, like a yeah. last attend Java One. So, so we probably met. And if you attend in JCP parties or things like that, then we probably that would, met. yes. Oh. That, okay, because because yeah. you know when when Frank mentioned your name, I was like, okay, I, I'm not sure I know him. And then I was like, wait, I. I, I know I know you're yeah. famous. So. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm famous as as yeah. you know. <laughs> I'm a guitar player in an all pointers band, yeah. right? Hey, wonderful! Yeah. Oh, you so know, I, I everybody knows me. <laughs> I didn't realize you were in all pointers too. Okay. Yes, yes. Now it's all clicking. Okay, that's yeah, that, yeah. that's probably where I've seen you the most. I'm guessing. Fra Fra Frank, me, uh, and a few other guys. We are the founding members of the all pointers band. You know. I did not Is it in that? Freddie's in it yeah, too. Yeah. Freddie's in it yeah, too. Pretty. And and Ed Burns used to be in it. with you guys. Ken Cousins. Yes, a, a yes, yes. Yeah. Oh. It does, isn't Ken? Isn't he the the singer or one of the singers? Yeah. He, sure. Yeah. He yeah. was, and he sang great last time. Even though he wasn't feeling one hundred percent, he sang great the last Java one. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So so for those so so there's so it's there's so much history here, but. For those who don't know, the Null Pointers is this band that plays at, at Java One conferences. Have you ever played at any other conferences or is it only Java One Dev Nexus, they always play. Oh, right. Dev Nexus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's it's uh these two guys um and a few other guys uh that uh that that put on a great little show. Um and it's kind of cool because you're like, hey, I know that guy. He, hey, and I'm I'm telling you, uh Frank really rocks the guitar. I must yes, say. he really does. <laughs> so, so, and I, I've, very always, good. I, I've always thought I, I'm I'm not actually good enough at playing anything to join this band, but it's fun to watch. Um, yeah. Well, we advertise that we're available for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and parties, and also quantum computer talks, machine learning talks, <laughs> and uh -huh. e-commerce architecture. <laughs> right, right, right. So you should just start writing songs about those things. <laughs> Leave it out there. The, um, Neil, Neil Ford and I, I think somebody else did, but it was mostly Neil, uh, Neil Ford and myself. We were talking about musicians and programmers and how there is a pretty tight coupling uh, between uh, musicians. And there are a lot, you know, that graduate, a lot of musicians that graduated with, uh, you know, musical degrees of some sort, uh, but, and they make fine programmers. There's a lot of, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, the balance of it, um, you so know, the I think tempo of the, it, it just fits really nicely with programming. The mathematics of it. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say math is the other, the other sort of pillar. Um, right. There's those of us for a little math challenge, like me. Like I, I, I took advanced math classes, but I never liked it. Um, yeah. And, I, and, and there were always people that took much more advanced math classes. So uh, yeah. I, I but, took advanced math classes, but I'm terrible at basic math, and it's embarrassing. Uh, mm, particularly yes. when I'm doing a conference talk, I'll be like, "Yeah, 360 times 60, which is whatever it is." <laughs> no, I, I'm the same. <laughs> way. I took like advanced math class, but if you give me something simple, I'm going to do horrible. Yes, my my kids will like call me out on that. And they'll, they'll tell me the answer, and they'll be like, "I'm like, dude, I, I don't have a calculator. It's too much." Uh, but anyways, <laughs> the point is that between the music and computers and uh, math, there's a, I think there's a big set of overlap. Um, oh, right. without without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So good Venn diagram. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, the other reason we had these two guys on in particular is because they've both been working a lot with artificial intelligence uh, and a lot with artificial artificial intelligence in the Java space, um, which is which is a, a special thing that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, Maybe. So uh, I, although I know we can talk about a million things, I think uh, AI is probably a good place to spend a decent amount of our conversation today. Um, and um, I'd like to go uh, before we get too deep into it. What I love it is I, I gave a little like, you know, very short synopsis of you guys. Um, but I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit more about your background and like, especially about the AI part, um, but also the other stuff. Um, so uh, Zorin, I'll start with you. Uh, so no, tell you. us more about Zorin, other than the, uh, you know, musician side. Yes, uh, well, uh, uh, what I've been doing, uh, teaching AI and software engineering at the University of Belgrade, and also uh, working with an open source community in Java space, building this uh, educational tool for neural networks when they were not a thing, uh, they were just a, a hobby of mine. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, when it uh, became a thing and very popular, I decided to create uh, to create a similar uh, tool for the uh, industrial grade applications, and that's how I created DeepNet and started this uh, entrepreneurial journey. And the thing is that uh, I, I've been uh, involved in the Java community a lot, and I really like this uh, old technology, the community, and the way of thinking. That's what I adopted, uh, and, but. Uh, I felt that that uh, uh, always something uh, you know uh, kind of missing um, because uh, all the machine learning tools are primarily done now Python based, and uh, the whole idea I wanted to create something similar, something uh, Java friendly, something that is more intuitive to Java developers to create a nice uh, standard API like a collections API for machine learning, if you want. Uh, and to, to make it easy to uh, to fluently code AI in Java, because uh, much of the tools that uh, uh, I've seen uh, are like a wrappers so having like a C car, uh, style of flavor, and uh, th th that's uh, I started my journey like uh, from so one side uh, researching AI algorithms and uh, new technologies, from the other side software engineering and me wanted to to do it in. In Java, and uh, entrepreneur in me wanted to make a kind of a real thing, not just uh, like a, a hobby project uh, or uh, you know a research project. So somehow I those three things came together, and now now and I'm actively working on this um, tool called DeepNets. And uh, so somewhere along the way, uh, the idea for like a standard Java API. Uh, for machine learning and uh, machine le applied machine learning, if you want, well, mm -hmm. we started with visual recognition. I heard about the uh, Java community process and uh, JSR and how it works, and that sounded like a really great idea. And uh, I think at our one of our gigs, Frank and I started talking <laughs> <laughs> about how how we really need API for machine learning, and said, "Okay, let's do it." And that's how we started. And uh, I'm very happy that we have managed to roll out uh, the, this official JSR for visual recognition using machine learning. And I think that, that was just like a first step. We met uh, a lot of interesting people. We started understanding the, the, the needs uh, of the enterprises and the developers and the problems that people are facing. And I think that we are on a good way to bring uh, like a, uh, the machine learning, learning to make it easier and more integrated into the Java space. Very nice. So there's there's so many things to unpack there, but uh, I, I guess my the first thing I want to mention is that um, so so this uh, JSR three eighty one is is an actual standard for visual uh, recognition mm -hmm. uh, in Java. Um, and does that mean it like ships with JDK? Like if I download JDK, like 
no, no. It, it's okay. a separate API. It's not part of the JDK itself uh, because uh, it will be very difficult to maintain it and change it and to evolve it if it is part of uh, the JDK. It would be, have to be officially supported. And it's very difficult to get in in the procedure. So that's not. A, it, it could be a JEP if you want to do it that way, but uh -huh. it is very difficult and basically mm -hmm. impossible. Uh, for like uh, independent like uh, developers to do it, you know, uh, and uh, uh, JSR is just a API. It's on the GitHub, and uh, it's available. It is part of the official release. You can take it just from the Maven. It is also available on the Maven, and uh, the main thing it allows you. It provides you a standard task. Uh, oriented API. For example, if you want to class classify some things, okay, then you have a classifier interface. If you want to predict numeric values, then you have regression interface. If you want to uh, classify images, you have image classifier interface. So basically, that's a, a high level API. So you don't have to deal with the tensors or you know lots of low level details, data structures that are used by the uh, machine learning libraries like a Python. Uh, you know, like an AmPy, you know, and all, all the things uh, and tensors in TensorFlow, but you have very high level API and it, it makes it very uh, readable and straightforward way to integrate that in, into your application as an application developer. So uh, we are assuming th this API is targeting primarily application developers. So you, so you want to use some uh, kind of machine learning feature and you want to be able to plug it and use it like in a meaningful way. So you have cl clear flow of the code. And one of the important things is that uh, you want to be able to change it. Once new models arrive and new techniques arrive and new frameworks arrive, you want to be able to change and use those algorithms without changing the entire application. So that's what we did. Uh, we have created uh, using this uh, uh, Java uh, service provider infrastructure and created a machine uh, learning abstraction layer. So basically you can plug uh, in uh, any engine uh, that provides uh, implementation of our API. Oh, really? Okay, so it's got an SPI thing. Yes. yes. So you can plug in like a TensorFlow implementation if you want it or... Uh, yeah. uh, once the TensorFlow implements our API, oh well, yes, possible, yes, theoretically. Yeah. So, so theoretically, is DeepNet yes. basically an implementation right now? Yes, yes. Okay. We, we, we provide DeepNet's a community edition as an implementation of the JSR and of also this uh, like a, a commercial edition, also professional edition supported. It also provides uh, supports that implementation. Okay. Okay. So, um, one of the things that and like I have a presentation called uh, Machine Learning Data Pipelines mm -hmm. uh, that uses uh, TensorFlow and we'll have that in the show notes, uh, but it uses TensorFlow, uh, Python-based TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, um, I create a web service using uh, TensorFlow serving. Mm -hmm. And then I have Kafka, you know, talk to that web service mm -hmm. to do any classification or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my thesis as part of that presentation is uh, it's really hard to get uh, data scientists out of Python and R. Um, what do you think the draw would be uh, with Java? Like, uh, what would, how would you bring those data scientists over to Java? Or is that not even the interest? Well, that's a big question because uh, it's a question of tooling. Data scientists are used uh, to tools that they are used. You know, they already have, and they have already built the entire pipelines, and they're used to. But theoretically, uh, it, it would be possible to to use. Uh, you know, Python is basically scripting language. So, uh, in my view, Apache Groovy is Python for Java. You know, Ooh. so the syntax and everything. If if you want. Uh, like that kind of a scripting and uh, easy easy syntax. Uh, uh, from what I look, uh, Apache Groovy can provide that and, and run on top of of the JVM. On the other hand, but when you have things like deep nets, you know uh, it, it supports importing TensorFlow models, so you can train model in TensorFlow and then export those uh, train model those weights and import, for example, in deep nets and run it uh, in, in Java. So wow, what, what format is that? 
Well, the, the way we did it is just uh, export it uh, uh, like a text file, just a weights file, kind of CSV file, you know? Okay. So we just, just all the weights from out, out of the, the, the TensorFlow train TensorFlow model and then import it in the, in the network. So okay. uh, w w there are challenges, of course, because uh, of uh, difficult to, to, to support the GPUs on Java, you know, uh, and uh, for large models, like for VGGNet, for example, it is very slow. Uh, but uh, I can announce that it is still not available in community edition, but at some point uh, we'll make that happen also. Uh, we uh, are using uh, NVIDIA GPUs using JCUDA, you know, because from uh, our wow. research and our experience, GPU support, if you want to do deep learning in modern machine learning, you cannot do it without uh, GPUs, you know. And uh, th there is no, unfortunately, there is no like official uh, support and libraries for that. Uh, and from my experience, JCUDA is just like a J J9 binding, which is very good library and oh, generated. Wow. So you, you can use it, uh, the, all those CUDA features. And uh, we have implemented the, this entire layer uh, for talking to GPUs using for deep nets using JCUDA. So we Wonderful. can really get uh, great performance when working with TensorFlow models is the same performance, you know. So well, we have uh, Frank here as well. I'd like uh, like to ask yeah, Frank on yeah. this one as well, um, and and uh, Zorin as well. Uh, there's a few new uh, JEPs that are I think going to make machine learning even better. Uh, one of them's I think the Vector API, and uh, the other one's uh, Foreign Function Interface. Do you? Uh, and uh, I'll throw that one to Frank. You uh, are those going to play a role in uh, machine learning? Actually, I think the the right person to answer that question on vector API would be Zorin, since he's oh, really okay. in, intimately involved with with that. Right. So Zorin, I just want to make sure you have timeshare as well. <laughs> but yeah, no problem. Yeah, Zorin. Well, yeah, do you know about yeah. that? Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, uh, vector API. This is my understanding. This is no official like uh, uh, yeah. interpretation. My understanding is this vector API is not going to have significant role because it's all about running vector operations on CPUs. Okay, it can make things faster for some algorithms that are can be efficient on the CPUs, but the main thing for the modern AI is happening on GPUs. So it's a large amount of computation done in batch and very highly parallelized, you know? And there's a large tensors, especially with those generative AI models, they are huge tensors. And uh, I mean, doing that on a CPU, that would be a thousand times um, slower in the best case, you know? Right, right. So I think vector API is not going to have significant role, but foreign uh, memory API, all the things for Panama project, are going to have a significant role. And what are we looking uh, now into is uh, uh, implement uh, all these features that we did with JCUDA to do the, the same thing using uh, Panama API. You know, okay. because when you when you want to use uh, GPU features, uh, the, the way it works, you move all the data from your uh, main memory, from your heap to memory on a GPU device. It performs the calculation and then you move it back to, 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 to your host memory. They call it host memory. And okay. this foreign memory API, and basically what you're doing, you're moving huge arrays. So all those tensors, they're packed into arrays that fit into the memory and you're moving huge arrays here to the GPU and backwards. And uh, uh, the foreign memory API is very important. For, and I think that the whole Panama API is very important because it feels free uh, developers of the pain of having to uh, create and maintain these JNI bindings, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, you know, you have to be Java developer and uh, a C developer yeah. in order to do that. And then with every new release, you have to recompile and, uh, you know, and build uh, these JNI bindings. And I think that uh, these uh, parts of the Panam API does that automatically for you. So I think that will be a big step. It won't uh, solve the entire machine learning problem for Java because uh, it, it won't, you know, what you will get that way, we get it like a, 
uh, uh, C flavored API, but just in Java, you know, and it's not right. just, you have the access to CUDA and you can do machine learning. You need more layers of abstraction to make it intuitive and easy to use uh, for Java developers, the, the way that they are used to work in Java. But uh, right. I, I think with time, the, the libraries uh, will develop such as DeepNets and JSR. But uh, I think we uh, need to, Java community and our ecosystem need to move faster uh, about that. I, I think I'd like to step, take a step back also sure. to just to add more color. Um, so, I mean, why is this important to Java developers? Why is it important to developers? So, so um, maybe I can tell it from my perspective why I got interested. So what, in your career, you probably get a chance to ride one major wave in your career, right? You ride, it's like, I'm going to jump on this wave and I'm going to take it for like 10, 15 years. So I've been extremely lucky that I've seen four waves. So I start off with Unix and C. And when I mean a wave, I don't mean just like learning a language or learning a little tool. I mean, something that has pervasive long, you know, like it has a community, there's economic uh, reasons, there's business reasons, there's, uh, um, you know, developer interests, there's non-developer interests. And so there's things that have long tail, right? There's an ecosystem. So not, not just little things. So Unix and C had that. So, so after that, um, I got involved in the hypertext community in the, in the late 80s, going way, way back. And that was eye-opening. And that led to, the, of course, to the web. And then the web in Java was the third thing I was interested in. And these are things that not only have helped my career, I mean, it's helped pay my mortgage, right? It's given me a good, yeah. good living, right? And it's and helped my right. family. So as you every now and then you have to st stop your career and say, okay, what's the next thing? And you look around, you're like a surfer in the ocean and you're looking at waves coming by and saying, well, it's a small wave. This is web three. Ah, this is crypto. Ah, no, no, no. Yeah, so yeah. you let them go. And then you see this monstrous wave coming and you see let's well, AI and ML and it goes, holy crap. And then like, okay, it's not just like learning Python, but it's like, it's about patterns and about how everything has is, has related to one another and how you can in, you know make insightful uh, thoughts about patterns and you can predict patterns or you can generate patterns. So, so that this that's the wave I want, I want to ride. So yeah. this is what we want to tell programmers that this is not just like a little um, you know here's a little um, data structure you should learn you should, you should know about. This is something that has geopolitical implications. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have like where I put the semicolon implications. It is it has geopolitical implications. Countries can go down because of ML, right? Or they can go up because of ML. Right? They affects it affects the GDP. This is why it's ultra, ultra important. And we're talking about something that's not gonna last for a year or two years. It has like 20, 30 years. So for, for young developers, you know, when they see things like, you know, chat GBT and my, my life as a programmer is over with because we don't need programmers more. You don't understand, we're just getting started. We're yeah. just getting started. You know, we're looking at things that's not just like a chatbot. Chatbots are like, that's the first, whenever something new comes by, you take what you've done for the past 10 years and you try to put it into the new world, right? right. And that's what chatbots, but that's just, you know, step zero. So what's after that? And it's implications, like I've read papers, like how this affects low level operating systems. So the actual data access, the way we access data, like with, with databases, all those all the algorithms related to databases and accessing data, how we structure caches in the operating system, that's all gonna change because of patterns and predicting things. This is like, it's it's like, this is cool. It's like really, really cool. And this is why developers need to be interested in it. The Java developers plus other developers. That's why it's really interesting. This is this affects everyone's lives, right? So it's, it's yeah. not just like learning a toolkit. That's why this really, really excites me. I probably would be, you know, I would probably have retired and gone fishing <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't for machine learning. This is so, this is so exciting. And there's opportunity for, for young developers to make a huge stance in something. Like it might not be chatbots, it might be something else. I, I use machine learning to predict this or to generate that. And I use that to feed itself. So it, we're at the very, very beginning of this long tail. Um, and I want developers, young developers to be, don't be afraid of this. This is something that's gonna extend your career. And you know, yeah. it's AI, AI is, is not gonna take your job. Somebody that uses AI may take your job, but AI won't take your job. So you have to be aware of these tools and you have to use these tools where it's appropriate. 
So that's right. what that's what really excites me about this stuff. Yeah, we had well, a. That, um, oh, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, so that, that that was actually leads me to another question. So I was going to ask you a bit about your background, Frank, and then ask you how you got interested in doing this with Zorin. <laughs> so. well, well, it is it is interesting. Um, so um, you know, I, I run, I founded the, the New York Java Sig. Um, the, the interesting story about that. So I I I founded the New York Sun User Group way back when. And oh, Sun user group. Oh, yeah. Okay. So so okay. it's interesting. So I worked for the Bell system in, in eight in New York, New Jersey, and and I worked part-time in the Bell Labs. And we had some really cool talks. Um, there were some interesting talks. I remember going to a talk where they said um cell technology would only be, you know, not used for voice, it would be used for other things, <laughs> you know, something uh, you know, in centralized internet hubs like there's one called IHNP4, which all internet traffic went through. ATT shut it down. They said there's no money to be made from the internet and we're shutting mm -hmm. it down. So there were talks like that that, that, I, that, I, that I went to it was uh, very, very interesting. But um I noticed I was getting these postcards from some microsystems on the West Coast saying all these cool talks. Like there was one of this user interface libraries, one is operating system internals, and there's this and that. But they were all in the, the Bay Area. So I was like, there's nothing in New York. And all we have here are there, we have like mainframes and like 3270 terminals. Like I want to get, you know, some of this cool stuff. So one of the Sun execs came to New York um, and I met with them. I started, I said, how come you guys don't have these cool talks in the New York and the Northeast area? His answer said he said that because there aren't any real programmers in New York. Dude, oh no. <laughs> What's going on? So here I am. I was working at Bell Labs. Like, you know what? There's there's a lot of good programmers at Bell Labs in, in New Jersey. And there's a lot of there's come a, on, actually, Bell Labs, Bell Labs invented Unix and invented C. I mean, that's that's where everything came from. What in Mary Hill, New Jersey, there are seven Nobel Prize winners under one roof. Oh my god. Right? So for, for so for this guy, I and it, I had the WTF bubble come up over my head. And I said, okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna do it myself. Right. And it's a the famous Alan Alan Kay quote that you know, you in the best way to predict the future is that you do it yourself, right? So mm -hmm. I I said, like, you know what, I'm gonna start getting some speakers. And I knew that Wall Street was a big customer base for some microsystems. So I said, let me reach out to some of my friends. I said, is there a room that I could I could use to, to I'll get a speaker? So I invited a speaker and I told some microsystem, I'm having this guy talk about Sun OS, you know, the operation system for, for some micro back then. And they said, oh, it's at Morgan Stanley. Oh, that's one of our customers. So so they, I sort of got that going. So over time, that kind of built up. And then um, when Java came around, they asked, Sun asked me to give a talk on Java. And I said, like, that's cool. What is it? So uh, they said, just give a talk. And this is September 1995. And, and here, here's some content. Go talk to James, who James Gosling, who I, I knew from a prior technology, uh, a windowing system. And so I asked, I said, James, like, what is this, another C++ or something like that? He goes, oh, no, no, it's, it's this and this. And my eyes widened. He goes, holy cow, I had this whole wrong. So uh, I gave this talk. So I was the first person outside of Sun to give a tutorial on Java. It was, I was the third person to give a talk on Java. I was the first non-Sun person. And I thought there would be like 75 people in the audience. And it was like 1,500 people in the audience. Oh, so, my God. So I said, you know what? The, you know, I told people, if anyone's interested in getting a talk about Java, after, after my talk, let's get back in a room and, and meet. And that night, we had four people interested. <laughs> we had four people. And I said, we're going to have... A, a division of the Sun User Group, the New York Sun User Group, called um, a, a special interest group. Back then in the 80s, that's what they were called. The, the special interest group was a subset of the main user group. So this was the Java SIG of the New York Sun User Group. But then that's over time, over time, the interest in Java went up, and the you know the interest in Sun went down because it was mostly sysadmin types. So we said, why don't you guys go off to the Linux community and, and talk about all that stuff, and we'll continue with the Java SIG. So if we let that go, and then, but the Java SIG remained the name. So that's why we keep the, we kept the name Java SIG. <laughs> uh, so so fast forward a little bit. So this is you know pre pandemic um, at Java One. Um, you know when I saw that machine learning was interesting, so I, I said like no, I could give a talk on it and get a panel on on what people think about it. Um, and little did I know that. Zorin was doing the same thing in, in another set of talks. He, he was in another part of um, 
I'm not sure it was Moscone or, or was someplace else, but it was in San Francisco. And I said, well, that's, that's cool. Someone else is doing this. And I didn't think about it. But then no pointers had a rehearsal. Mm-hmm. For And then we walk in the room and there's the guy that was given to talk about machine learning with Zorin. So it was, it was just the null pointers got us together and we start talking, you know, and then over time we got together and had our mutual interests and we both wanted Java developers to play in the game. We wanted Java developers not to be left out, right? So we wanted, it was important for Java developers to, to program in ML. This was too important. This was not like, you know, when the web was invented, it was JavaScript, only JavaScript. Right. So here was this fantastic thing that was given from the gods you know, I'm on Olympus. Here's the web, but you can only program in JavaScript. You know, it's like having a rock band, and I give you know, you have a sax player, drummer, bass player, and guitar player, and instead of your instruments, I give you a kazoo. And you're all all you need to create a hit song, but you only have a kazoo. That's what I think that that's that's the <laughs> metaphor that I use. It's, it's not so much a dig on, on JavaScript, although I can do that. It's it's not a dig on JavaScript. It's just that you can't have one way to express your creativity. Yeah, that's just bad. That's just bad, bad, bad. So we need to have Java develop playing the game and C plus plus and you know and then all these other languages. We have so many good languages nowadays. So they all need the playing game. We can't be constrained. Our creativity cannot be constrained through one language. It's, that's really, really bad. So I didn't want that to happen. So I, I want to be sure that certainly Java developers. So Zara and I have been going around talking about you know um, Java and ML and we did the JSR, which has been very, very popular. We've been talking about it at all the, the Jug Leader Summits and, and the, all the conferences. So it's gotten very, very popular. And certainly now with generative AI, it's gone to the next level, right? So right. Uh, there's a lot of interest. Wonderful. I'm I'm so glad. I remember when you guys started this, and I was like, I'm so glad they're doing this. Um, yeah. So, good. so here here's my question. Um, so, uh, well, here's a question I should say. Uh, okay. So right now, the JSR focuses on um, and, and visual recognition, which is a part of machine learning, right? And then everyone's all excited about uh, generative AI, which is also part of machine learning. Um, but I guess what I wanted to get a handle on is number one, can you sort of explain the differences between them um, and how they work? And obviously not in detail how they work, but what's different about how they work. Uh, but then also like, what is the strategy for allowing Java to do generative AI stuff? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, the, that's a really tough question. And uh, I can say uh, just how I see it at, at this moment. Um, generative AI are basically uh, neural networks, okay, a type of machine learning technique uh, that uh, is being also um, used for like uh, this traditional machine learning problems like classification and regression that we dealt in JSR. Uh, but uh, this type of neural net- networks are able to process this data in a different way. And this so-called transformer type of networks, which uh, uh, using uh, encoder and decoder architectures. Uh, I'm not if I I don't know if I'm too technical getting into details, but uh, I would like to say basically it's the same thing. You know, at, at the basic level, it's the same thing. Just these models transformer are much bigger, and uh, the way they are different compared to like a deep learning models used before is that they can be more efficiently uh, use GPUs for calculating a large amounts of data, you know? Mm-hmm. So they are not so-called the re- recurrent models because the text uh, text processing uh, have been done using those LSTM models or recurrent models because you have a sequence of words and you don't know exact length of the words, you know. So it can be three words or five words or 15 words, you know. So the way that thing has been processed is using these uh, so-called recurrent models. But uh, uh, the problem with recurrent models is that you cannot use GPUs for efficiently processing because you have to move data in, in batches and Calculation always depends on the calculation in previous step. So these transformer models have been adapted to do uh, uh, processing uh, for uh, uh, text 
text processing language generation. And uh, basically it's the same thing, it just can be uh, kind of different internal things that can work more efficiently with larger amounts of data. Uh, but uh, when we are talking uh, about like doing things like uh, chat GPT, uh, we should have in mind it's something that's really, really uh, large. You know, it, they, they are called the large models uh, for a reason. Uh, they are really big models uh, trained with uh, huge amounts of data. And, and from what I heard, uh, I read about this uh, Bloom, I think, model. Uh, it is being trained on a supercomputer by French government that has like a, oh uh, I don't know, hundreds of GPUs, like 300s of GPUs, a cluster, you know. So it's not something that is available for uh, to an uh, average developer or even company, you know, some uh, even large companies. It, it's very costly. And the training of that model costs like three to five million dollars and lasts like for three months and takes... Uh, like uh, 200 uh, people to, to, to work that, including preparation phase and so on. But it's not only the training. You, know, you, you have to do a lot of experimenting. It's, it's cutting edge. You do not just do uh, software development. You do a lot of research. And there are different phases of training. First, you're trained with a large amount of data you get from Wikipedia or wherever. And then you uh, specialize those models for specific tasks, for specific domain to learn that one better. And the third phase is uh, most difficult because uh, it uses re so-called technique called the reinforcement learning, which gets human feedback. Basically, you give a model to talk to humans and humans said which answers they prefer. And it takes time, it takes resources, and you it takes you know somebody to handle all of that. So building a model on your own, it's a, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, but the way it is popular now to do it is uh, using those open source models that are provided by Facebook, these Llama models. And uh, you can get these pre-trained models and use it from uh, uh, even your desktop computer or from service. But the thing is, those models are very big, you know. They take uh, about 16 uh, gigabytes of memory to, to, to be able to, to work. And uh, it, it take also take, they can work on CPU, but imagine that you have it like a, in a concurrent environment where lots of people are asking. It, it really demands a very uh, large infrastructure and to make it work. So the way it is being done is mainly using as a service uh, using these uh, APIs that talk to uh, cloud-hosted uh, these uh, uh, models. So Frank Cantel uh, had some, I know he had some experience with it. And uh, how we are going to approach it and to do it, uh, oh, I, yeah, I don't know if a kind of standard API makes sense because the way the people are using those models is just send the query, send the prompt, and you get the text there. Send string, get string. So. You don't right. need much of an API to do things like that. You can do it how, however you want. And uh, building and training models, it is too difficult to do it now for anyone. Uh, I'm not sure it makes sense. And the thing is, um, those models are mainly, I, I mean, ten, before uh, these models built by OpenAI, the TensorFlow was the thing. Now the PyTorch is the thing because all of those models oh. are being built in a PyTorch, you know? So uh -huh. it is a really game changer, you know? Uh, right. So how how to do it? Okay, for Java developers, now it's using like a service from API and uh, in the near future, yeah, we're thinking about it. All right. Interesting. Interesting. But I should also point out that, you know, there's a, um... I guess re up until recently, there was a notion that you have to become a data scientist to program, you know, to play around with machine learning. And I think from, you know, my experience as a, as a teacher and, you know, and even taking courses like statistical analysis course, numerical analysis courses, I mean, I know that the bulk of developers are not going to be data scientists, right? It's, I mean, the, the average developer about matrix manipulation and they won't understand what that means right so so um most of the people will be model users 
right? Model user. So there has to be in, uh, useful APIs for like for Java developers and for C, you know, C developers, uh, C++ developers. They're going to be mostly using models. So like for a generative AI, there's foundation, there's the foundation models, right? The open AI and, and Google's, you know, uh, their models and Anthropic and all these other companies, they have a foundation model. So there are architectures now you layer an additional model on top of that. There's a foundational model and then you yeah, fine tune model that sits on top of the foundation model that you're yeah. tweaking the foundational model. That's one way of doing it. There's, so like, there's three ways of like programming from a generative AI point of view, there's three ways of programming. There's there's what's called prompt engineering, which prompt engineering is just a way of structuring what you what Zorin said, what you tell the, the language LLM, right? I mean, honestly, in a few years, we probably won't be doing prompt engineering. Machines will be doing prompt engineering, yeah. but that's a little <clears> few <throat> years, few years out. The second yes. thing is that good. Sorry, sorry, Frank. Just to jump in, maybe this uh, my opinion of mine is controversial, but I think prompt engineering is cheating. You know, it's just a way to make it look like it works. So, in order to understand, <laughs> you give the right answer. You should ask me the way you it wants you to ask, you know? So I think prompt engineering is cheating to make this model look better than they are actually, you know? Right, well, actually the, the terms, it, this is what's interesting. When I first heard the terms prompt, like when using OpenAI, I, heard, I saw the term prompt and I saw the term completion and mm -hmm. it, it kind of puzzled me, prompt and completion. Well, it, so it turns out that an LLM is just an engine, it's a pattern engine, right? It's a pattern engine. You have to kickstart, you have to touch it so it goes off some way. So the way that you touch it, so it goes off when you give it a prompt, you're prompting it with text to get it started. You know, it's like writing some music. You give it a few notes and then let random numbers generate the rest of the rest of the yeah. rest of the notes. It, that's so you prompt, you prompt the engine by giving it, here's a direction I want you to go in. So you're guiding the initial, um, you know, square zero, right? You're, you're giving it a prompt and then you're asking, please complete my pattern based upon what I've given you. So that's where the term you're prompt and a completion. You're completing the patterns based upon the foundation model. And what Zora said is this prompt is sort of like it's a guide. Here's sort of like the way I want you to complete it. So that's where the terms prompt and completion come from. And and it's right. It's it's a sense of um, I, I do agree, Zora. It's, it's like a it's like um, a trick. It's a it's a trick. Um, but it's the way that you program the LLM. Yeah, right so the way I think about it is sort of like, I mean, it's pretty early days, right, for, for the chatbot interface. So there's a lot of things it doesn't infer. Um, and it's sort of like learning learning the interface, like learning how much it, it understands. So like a good example is I, I was trying to, um, uh, I was trying to get a picture of a carrier pigeon holding a thread for a presentation about virtual threads. Um, so I just said carrier pigeon holding a thread. And then what I got was like pictures of like threads hanging out of the, the, the pigeons wings and all sorts of other places. And th this was from Dolly. Um, and I'm like, okay, so it doesn't know that the pigeon needs to hold the thread by its beak or its sure. talons or something. Um, so I just tried the same prompt with um, stable uh, diffusion. Yeah, they have a new one out that just came out, and it, it actually had it with holding, holding the thread with its beak, and that was that was its initial problem. So it's like, so it's like you know, to me, it's more about understanding how to interact with that particular LLM than anything else. Right, and in every model, so so um, OpenAI has like fifty, yeah, fifty models. So when you when you write your REST program to access OpenAI, you have to tell it which model you want to use based upon mm -hmm. how good it is, how how expensive, how cheap it is, th th those mm -hmm. type of things. Um, and every model is different. So when you have a prompt that works one model, it might not work that well for the other model. Right. <laughs> so that's another issue that like, how do, how do we evolve these things going forward? Enterprises are probably going crazy. Like this is non-deterministic. How do I come up with a test cases for non-determinist? It's like, you know, testing, it's like um, finding a, a thread bug. Right. It's like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> like, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a similar, it's a similar problem. So uh, I had a question about um, uh, just because data scientists tend to use a Jupyter notebook and a Jupyter lab. Uh, mm -hmm. I know in the JavaScript we have Zeppelin. Uh, is Zeppelin good enough, or do we need something different, or does Zeppelin need to be enhanced? 
uh, or do we not use notebooks in the uh, Java AI space? Well, I, I don't know. I, I actually, I, I don't use Zeppelin. Uh, I, I be, I, I've been using, I, I myself really got into this Python <laughs> uh, ecosystem while exploring machine learning more. And uh, notebooks are, are fine, but, uh, you know, from my experience, you, they, they are very messy, you know, to, 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 to work with. Uh, and in Java space, I think uh, we do have actually in our JSR uh, notebooks uh, for for, uh, for uh, our JSR. I think uh, uh, notebooks mm -hmm. can be used for Java also. I know we have a contributor who created that. I, I didn't work on that, but uh, you can use notebooks uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Java also. So right. or Groovy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I really like Groovy very much because when I was looking, well, this is Python for Java. You know, it, 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 you have a, the same kind of syntax, the, the same thing. Uh, it just uh, everything you you can connect to any like uh, existing Java API. And for people who like to work that way, uh, of course, the problem is you technically you can do it. But uh, there are still many layers, many things, many libraries, mature libraries, and uh, implementation of specific algorithms are missing. Somebody has to do that, you know. And yeah. uh, the Python community has been doing it for years, you know, and they have been supported by Google. I think the, the, the whole Scikit-Learn project started a, a, as the Google Summer of Code, uh, from what I... Oh, wow, I, I didn't know that. From the, wow. Hmm. I, I think that there's on their side, but significant part of the development of the whole ecosystem was supported by uh, you know one big company, and they have a lots of algorithms. And I was very surprised when a few the release one point something I know was like after ten years of development, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they created a really strong community. And it is very pity to see the Java uh, had a really strong. Uh, stronghold in the uh, academic ecosystem and all the universities were teaching Java and all, all many open source projects were using Java and for research, for everything using Java and suddenly it's not the case because it is easier, it is faster to do it like uh, in Python or, or some right. other existing tools. So it's not just about the language, it's also about the available libraries, and uh, tools that are available to, to yeah. use, you know? Right, one and of the, uh, one, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go on. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask, uh, since we're on that topic of tools, um, I believe, there's a strong opinion on my part, or uh, I think it's close to fact, uh, that uh, you need visualization tools in order to do effective machine learning, just because you need Definitely, to, definitely. Yeah, you you need to, you that. know, take a look at the epics yeah. and your, what is it, your local uh, minima yeah. and all that stuff. and. And yeah. even if you're using scikit-learn stuff, you know, you see blobs, lines, or whatever. Yeah, we, we don't have a good game in Java. Is that correct, or am I wrong as far as visualizations go? Well, uh, well, that's the thing. Uh, we do have we do have great visualization toolkit like a Java Fix. Oh, it's know. awesome, right? We oh, have okay. we have right. amazing th things that is being done for visualization by the community in that space. But we don't have uh, uh, widely adopted libraries that are for th this kind of uh, statistical data science type of visualization. Like we don't have matplotlib for Java. You know, we don't have that. A and also, uh, the thing that we uh, don't have is that integration with other libraries. We we do we have pandas in Python for working with uh, data, right? From data frames, we do have uh, it sits on top of a NumPy, which is a multi-dimensional library. Uh, we do have uh, a Matplotlib for different visualization. We do have Seaborn that uh, really makes it even that kind of visualization uh, uh, for the da data flow. So all these libraries are working fine together. And in Java, we have a dozens of different ML libraries which don't work with, with each other together. Every library yeah. has its own data set. In, mm -hmm. in Python, you have pandas, you have NumPy, okay, that's multidimensional. You have uh, uh, pandas for data frame and every, 
all the other, the entire ecosystem works well with each other. So the idea, one of the inspired with that, the idea of uh, JSR, okay, we want to have like a, a data set in, interface that will be a common data set. It doesn't matter in which framework you're using, you have a data set and you should be able to use the data in whatever engine that you want to do. If you want to classify stuff, you have classifier interface. And okay. the way you are building it, one of the uh, uh, challenges is that those building machine learning models require setting of many different parameters. So we do want it to standardize way to do it, like using commonly uh, common builder pattern, you uh -huh. know, and, and things like that to make it, uh, uh, you know, so Java developer can use it without actually knowing all the low level details, how to do it uh, on their own, just from uh, looking at, at the API. Okay. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. The visualization is must have. And not just, uh, you know, TensorFlow is TensorFlow because they have a tensor board, you know. So you, right. you, you, can, mm -hmm. you can really analyze what the model is doing. So not just a simple visualization like a scatter plots and these uh, histograms, but what the model is doing and understanding uh, her, her, why it is giving some specific output. So absolutely yeah. agree. So cool. what's required in all things to work is to connect all these different things. It's not easy, but I think this JS, uh, JSR effort, probably not the final solution, but uh, uh, the right step towards a solution. And maybe, you know, other people in other J JSR will, uh, will yeah. be created. And get things uni unified, because I, uh, and that was kind of like unified. my next question, yes. Uh, yes. is um, H2OAI, uh, Spark, you know, they have, you know, HOAI is, is all AI. Spark is a lot of different things, but they also have, you know, uh, Perceptron and, really, yes. uh, and, you know, they have machine learning models. Um, I know Databricks, which is the backing company for Spark, has a notebook. Uh, H2OAI has a notebook and visualizations uh, as part of it. Um, what's going to be for deep nets and open source AI? What's going to be what's going to be the recipe of like, you know, how are Java programmers going to get everything, the visualizations, the uh, the large amount of different, you know, variety of models, you know, how do you see that experience coming to fruition? Well, uh, what we are uh, our path is to put that in the into the ID, okay. So okay. uh, for, for this community edition, it is not available, but there is a free uh, uh, edition for the, which can use be for development. And what we did, we, we took a NetBeans, a NetBeans platform, and put uh, like uh, wizards and JavaFX visualizations. You know, so many of the things that are available from from those tools. You have like a wizard that guys you said, yeah, I want a new ML project. I want to build image recognition. These are the images. I want to use this kind of model. And you just follow the wizards, you know? So you don't have to be like a data scientist that knows how to work with the image pixels and how to transform it, how to you, you want to divide them with some numbers to make it more between zero and one, how to standardize them and why and so on. So those are many low level technical details, which like uh, uh, probably 80% of the Java developers don't know. Uh, so I think the tools is the answer, but like a more high level tools, not, not the tools that, you know, uh, gives you ability to, to mess around with low level details from the project, but to understand what the model is doing and why it is doing something, you know, and to make it easy to manipulate that model and to support the entire process end to end. So you can run with it and you can build the model. And at the end, you get a jar file with a model that you, you can plug into your application, maybe distribute with Maven or whatever. That's cool. This is very important for, um, for young Java developers too, right? Because you know, now that Java is 27, 28 years old, um, you know, the complaint from young developers, like, why should I use Java? Right? It's like, it's old, it's an old technology. And, and you know, we, we've talked to Oracle about this too. Like they, they want to promote it also. Yeah, well, it's like, yeah, it's like you, you need to have quote unquote modern Java and promote yeah. modern Java, right? As a, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's that's deprecated information. And you know, it's that's one of the bad things about the web is 
how to detect deprecated information. If somebody could solve that problem, that's a, be a billionaire. Um, but so this is important. So machine learning, you know, deep net community edition, the JSR, this is important to attract the younger developers. So we actually created a little slide deck uh, on, on machine learning and our JSR. And we had a couple of professors recently use our slide deck uh, with college students. And they, they said the college students were really surprised how easy it was to create machine learning applications. You know, Ken Fogel from uh, Dawson College up in Canada. And we do recently had another professor use our slide deck and, and they both had very, very positive reaction to students as opposed to them saying like, well, this is Java. I, I don't want to learn. I have to learn Python. You know, I have to learn something right. that's more modern. It's like, right. and they were all excited that they could actually create these models and like detecting images and recognize images. This was fantastic. So this is important for young Java developers too. Yeah. And only also thought that we were very excited to learn that uh, their uh, experience and feedback was, wow, this is easier than Python, you know? Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, I, I, think, the, I think that's, uh, sorry to cut you off. I, I was no, just no, gonna, go, go on. I think that's, that's one area where it's like there's a certain Java way of doing things. Um, and this is something that I think, you know, I remember someone telling me a long time ago, they're like, yeah, you know, the, the programming languages you learn affects like the way you perceive, you know, though your approach, your problem solving approach, which is why it's good to learn different programming languages, because then you can think in different ways. Um, but by the same token, you know, providing APIs that allow you to do that same stuff in a different way, I think is, is really compelling. It doesn't all have to be done in one way, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, to your, to your point, uh, for people that are just building applications, you need to be able to, to, to start using AI and you want to be able to do it using whatever tool sets you're currently using. If you're already using Python, you may as well continue using it. If you're already using Java, you should be able to continue using Java. Um, yeah. Yeah. With, without, with, without a doubt. I mean, we're not criticizing python python's a really good language right yeah it's a very right. it's a very good language it, it's just that it, we can't relegate all of our creativity through one language as that's yeah. your point here right so that that's uh that's a, that's what we think yeah but it's not only about the creativity you know uh because uh, when i say i'm doing uh, ai in java uh, one of the first question i get why you are using ai in java <laughs> Uh, why don't you use Python? You know, so I was do, doing my research, you know, to to, to find a question. Why? So, what should be the argument? And what I found out that uh, Python actually has a really a big uh, scalability issues. You know, um, also they do have like a multi-threading. You know, support the the, the multi-threading. Uh, basically, uh, the basic Python has only a single thread, so it, it has really uh, problems with doing multi-threading. Uh, the performance it gets for the machine learning applications is uh, using uh, this integration with C, you know, for NumPy and uh, this implementation are based uh, with the uh, vector libraries that are written in C. And also TensorFlow uh, is uh, uh, the entire engine is written in C++ and with, with GPUs. So the Python mm -hmm. is just uh, on top of it. It's just a scripting language on top of the C. You know, so that kind of scripting language for Java, it could be Apache Groovy. It's the same look and feel as Python. But again, we are missing, you know, adopted libraries and tools written in Java Groovy to make that happen. So the question is, how do we make that critical mass of developers and people creating libraries and creating mature enough libraries. I think some kind of, uh, I know, community effort, collaboration, it, it cannot be achieved without that. And, and and I think that that happened because Google was behind all those initiatives. Yeah, I, I so, think that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we really do need uh, some companies who are interested in doing uh, machine learning in Java to, to stand up, uh, behind all those initiatives and say, okay, if you build that, we are we, we would be interesting to using it and, and promoting it. And it would help their users, you know. I mean, Amazon create we didn't mention that tool, created DJL. So it is also one very interesting uh uh framework. Not know if you're familiar with it. It's a basically yeah. Java API that wraps like TensorFlow or PyTorch or or, or uh MXNet or different uh frameworks. So 
I think the, the, their idea was just to bring, you know, Java developers to use their cloud, you know, with, with DJL. And, and I think from what I saw from the blog post, Netflix uh, had the use case for analyzing logs in real time, and they did want, want to do it, uh, did it with DJL and using this Amazon infrastructure. So I think they, 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 they will be possible to find like a business interest and uh, motivation for companies to, to support the Java in, in AI space. Right, well, yeah, the other thing, you know, Zorn, just remember when we first started, uh, as Java champions, we were interested in a Java API for machine learning, but you know, we probably should ask other people, maybe it's just our perception. So we went out, I mean, we talked to Amazon, we talked to IBM, we talked to Twitter, the, before Elon took over. Uh, we talked to <laughs> Azul, we talked to Alibaba, uh, and oh. and who else we talked? We even talked to Brian Getz about this. So, I mean, it was a hundred percent. Are you would you be interested in a Java API for, for machine learning for deployment? It was a hundred percent across the board. They all wanted Java API, especially for production deployments. So mm -hmm. when these big companies were saying yes, 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 you know, Zara and I, we looked at each other. And goes maybe we, maybe there is a future for this stuff. And we need to work on it. So it's not just just us doing it. The, the, these big companies, I mean, how many companies use Java? I mean, it's like 99% of all enterprises use Java, right? For, for production deployments. Of course they want you know, an API for, for machine learning because they want to deploy it now for the for next 20 years. There are going to be all kinds of ML applications, right? So um, there's definitely a, a need for it, a big enterprise need. Yeah, and I'm looking at the DJL. Let's pretty cool so so is dgl is that something that if they if they were smart they would start using the um they become an spi for the uh the um uh jsr 381 well actually they have implemented the part yeah, yes yeah it's yeah, right. they, yeah. They, they, they are wow. members of the jsr yes yes yeah, excellent yeah. okay right. all right that, that's really great to hear because i i was just thinking like this this brings me to one of one of my bigger uh, thoughts about this. So one of the things I noticed about these the models, especially the large language models, is that they use a lot of CPU, right? Um, a lot of GPU, I should say, um, which, uh, which number one, seems like a logical play for any cloud provider to provide service. I would honestly expect Oracle to be doing a lot more in this space, but that's just my perspective. Um, so um, but the, other, the other thing and I'm thinking about is climate. Um, because we've got a situation now where we're everybody's playing with all these large language models. You know, I can't imagine what the uh, cloud footprint of OpenAI is on Azure right now. Um, so, uh, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I think I think you know what 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 amazes me about our industry is that we're always able to whatever resources we have, we're always able to max them out. Like. <laughs> You know, whatever happens, however, however much disk space we get, however much RAM, however much CPU, you know, now it's GPU we get, we're always able to figure out a way to, to use as much as we possibly can. Um, and I, I was actually thinking recently that we got into a point where a lot of the systems we have really weren't, you know, yeah, a whole bunch of little microservices. It, 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 the more load you get, the more resources you use, but individually we were making them a lot smaller, right? So. So things were actually looking pretty good, but then then all the ML stuff comes along and it's like, okay, all of a sudden you need all this computing power to answer a simple question. Um, so yeah. I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think those models, uh, they, they were actually like a research result. It is very interesting research result and it, it have uh, interesting application. But I think that the models will become smaller over time and more specialized, you know, so they will demand less resources. The more we start to understand them and to figure out specific uh, application and use cases, then we are we would be able to 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 make them smaller. Because uh, I agree with you uh, that uh, uh, those models are are too big and too 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 resource, but that's just the first stage, you know. This is the, the first, first, first generation, like first, imagine first computers, like they, they were like a building, you know? So we now have a, a, a sure. buildings for the LLM models, you know? And uh, <laughs> uh, in, uh, in a decade, we might have uh, mobile phones, you know, with, with LLMs that, that can do everything. So, and I think the technology will also evolve, you know? 
And now they they are GPUs, but uh, quantum com computing is just now in research. But in ten years, you know, uh, they will probably replace uh, GPUs. You know, and th 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 that will be uh, it, it's a it's a matter of evolution of research and evolution of technology, and and definitely there will be some kind of solution. You know. Yeah, it's like it, it's you, you. You can't just look at what's happening now, but you kind of project out like as Zoran saying, look three to five years out, like near term future. It, it's like the way things are going, and now we're seeing the transform architecture and desktop LLMs, right? And that's so like that's like the next evolution. Who knows what's the the thing after that? Uh, so we're we're like as Zoran said, we're at the be just at the beginnings. This is a long tail. And there's so many things, so many ideas. There's so many startup companies yet to be created that that use this stuff. It's it's uh, it's a very exciting time. Yeah, that, that reminds me. I have a an, another pick here. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Wow, you guys, you guys are really good at making my my head spin here. Uh, <laughs> lots of things to think about. Um, so uh, there's okay. There's I'm trying to think of what. So there's I, there's a couple of tools I wanted to mention that I thought were new. I wanted to get your take on. Um, so maybe I'll just jump to those. Um, so I think like a lot of people, I'm watching all these AI tools, all these companies coming and seeing what they're building, and also companies we know. So uh, IntelliJ just added their own um, AI coding assistant, uh, which I, I noticed, and then they actually have a. I've actually separately been using this tool from them called Grazy Professional, which uh, is for technical writing. Um, so then now they have a you know JetBrains AI site, of course. Um, but uh, so uh, um, this AI coding system is a, it's a robust IntelliJ plugin that empowers developers to streamline their coding workflow using ChatGPT slash GPT four, and it complements other plugins such as Co Co GitHub Copilot or AWS Code Whisperer. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, our plugin actively invokes actions that complement and enhance your coding experience. And I, reading it, I couldn't really get a good example good example of what's better about it than or what's different about it than Copilot. But they say it, it, it uh, augments it. So I was curious if any of you guys had heard about this or were played with it or anything. I haven't well, played around directly with it, uh, Keto. Um, I, I think it's. Um, it's still early in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. These things still hallucinate and they still don't give correct answers. So uh, yes, it, it is an accelerated way of looking at, you know, stack overflow or something like that, right? It's just like an enhanced way of doing that. Um, mm -hmm. But Mozilla recently shut down their chatbot because it was giving bad answers. And then to their credit, sure. they shut it down. They were public about it. So um, we are still early. We're still learning a lot. And mm -hmm. these things are still hallucinating. Um, so we need, you don't just, this is interesting. If you're a tech writer, the, the, the future of tech writing has completely changed now, right? You're no longer just writing text and putting up there on a web page. You're now deploying an application. And we know what happens when you deploy applications, all kinds of, you know, QA and there's maintenance and there's the mm -hmm. debugging. So it's it, tech writing is completely changed now. Right. And now you have to constantly QA the answers and, and you have to look at what answers did it give? Maybe we have to agree. Correct. So there it's now you're now deploying an application. So uh, and, and to their credit, Mozilla said, like, you know what? This is giving wrong answers to our docs. We're shutting it down. So we are. It's still early. It's still early. Yes, there are some good things. Um, it does know how to look at some code and generate code. Um, I still see developers asking ChatGPT for code, and they copy paste it and run it. I said, you know, that's a tremendous security <laughs> gamble, don't you think? Don't you think? Sure. You know, just co copy paste it into you know and run it. I mean, take a look at it, see what it's doing. Make sure it's a, maybe yeah. there's some sort of sandbox you run it. But I see developers doing it right away. I said, are you kidding me? We're supposed to be the smart people on the planet, and look what you're doing. Right. 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 <laughs> uh, there is. Uh, oh, speaking. Of, so go ahead, uh, Anna. Oh, no, I was just going to mention that uh, that was greater, Frank, because I, I keep saying that, that uh, this is just a, a robot oriented way of uh, taking a look at Stack Overflow. Uh, that Stack Overflow is, you know, the way we use it or the way a, um, you know, a good programmer should is, you know, take a look at the date, 
uh, you know, uh, <laughs> right. was this Java back in, you know, <laughs> JDK right. 8 or without using lambdas? And, you know, you have to know a lot of, you know, particularly for all of us who use Java, like, you know, use a, a primitive stream if you're going to be doing a lot of computation, because if you have a box stream, that's, you know, all these little things you have to know about. You have to have knowledge uh, and knowing what is the correct answer and what is not the correct answer. And maybe you just need a little help from that Stack Overflow. And I think that's what it is. But if you take it wholesale and bring it in, and uh, whether it's Stack Overflow uh, or an AI, uh, you're you're doing a, a very uh, you know big disservice to uh, whatever risk, project. Tremendous risk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the other thing is, and I think I mentioned this on the previous one, I just wanted to reiterate it. Uh, lawyers are going to kill AI anyway. Uh, it's is still my bet. <laughs> And uh, the last time we talked about it, we didn't know about Sarah Silverman, the actress. Uh, I don't know if you saw that news story, uh, but yeah, I didn't have that on my bingo card that a uh, comedian was going to be the the first one to launch a salvo against uh, AI and how they source uh, information and material. But um, we'll see what happens. I, I think more and more people are going to be very particular about how AI engines, um, you know, train their models and where they get their sources and start demanding payments for it. So uh, there is yeah. uh, there is going to be that facet, or at least that's what I think. That's a, that's my prognosis. <laughs> well, I as speaking of business for IP law, for IP lawyers. Yeah, that, that'll yeah. Be you know what? Oh, sorry. I, I was just really one yeah. quick thing. Um, you know, if you're a seasoned developer and you're interested in legal, uh, you have so much money <laughs> to make. Uh, if you're becoming yeah. an AI lawyer. And you yeah. know programming very well and the data science yeah. behind it. And then you take yeah. a block, you have it made. <laughs> Maybe, man, if only I thought about this a couple of years ago, I could have gone back to law, gone to law school. Mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, uh, the only other thing I was going to say is um, you guys were talking about Stack Overflow. I noticed that they now have uh, their own uh, API, which, which I thought was really smart for them to do. So it's the cool. thing. Uh, didn't they make an announcement that you shall not, or like some big commandment, thou shall not use AI uh, with anything on Stack Overflow or, or you should maybe not produce maybe anything? Maybe so they could use their own tools. I don't know. Yeah, it um, could be. They're sitting they, on a lot of good info. I know. And like uh, like my my favorite developer search engine, Find, P-H-I-N-D, they, they pretty much is just like, it's just all references to Stack Overflow pretty much. <laughs> um, but, uh, but now uh, they they have uh, this overflow AI, which to me is just like, they're providing AI based interfaces into their stuff, essentially. Um, and they're also using it for their um, their commercial product as well, which to me, the whole commercial side of this, or, you know, the whole sort of wall garden side of this has a ton of uh, potential, right? You know, it's at least all this, you know, all the questions and answers within your company are going to be more um, uh, more nuanced, hopefully, <laughs> than what you get in the wild internet. Yeah, I mean, yeah it'll, 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 be, it'll get better over time. And in, in I guess in the long term future, you might think like, why are we creating docs in the first place? If we're going to have <laughs> machine learning, you know, create machine a, a chatbot from it, maybe we need to reverse it and not have flat text. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe yeah, Kito, what you just said, I think it makes a really lot of sense. Uh, using uh, uh, a thing, uh, these large language models as a language interface, you know, say so they, they don't understand, they don't have knowledge. They just kind of look that they understand. And actually, they are trained to pick the uh, answer that uh, makes sense. And this part of the training process where people are giving feedback, it's getting good and good better and better at it. So yeah. using LLM models as a language interface, definitely, that really makes sense. What you just described with Stack Overflow. But they have their own internal system, I, I, I'm guessing, and people are voting. So that's kind of human-based reinforcement learning. Those oh. votes that they are ranking their uh, yeah. answers, that's, oh, this is the right answer. And you know, the words that get minus one, oh, this is the wrong uh, uh, answer. Don't learn this, you know. So the same process happens behind in uh, in uh, uh, building the models, you know, or closed models. But I think Stack Overflow is a good example where you, it is transparent, you know. What you see on Stack Overflow is actually what is happening during the last phase of training these 
language interfaces you know and right. they're just pulling the just maybe getting you faster to 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 the answer faster than you would search you know for keywords and then finding a number of answers and figuring out which one gives you uh, the best for you right right, right. Well, one of the things when you talk about training, um, I, I think about the, one of the first things I think about is a bias, right? Especially mm -hmm. since you have people doing it and people, yes. no matter, no matter yes. who you are, like the, there's all sorts of bias in people. It's just how we are, unfortunately. Yeah, yes. like I don't, I don't consider .NET programmers programmers. That's my bias. Yeah, and Frank doesn't think JavaScript is a real language. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so this sort of dovetails with some of the work that you've been doing, Frank, um, with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm mm -hmm. curious, like, number one, um, do you think the industry is doing enough to sort of uh, counter the, the possibility of bias? Because I know early on, this has been an issue just with, you know, stuff like the, the uh, photo manipulation on iOS, like all sorts of stuff like this, all the, all the image stuff, you know, um, I, I've heard has gotten better. I haven't done any empirical analysis. What, what, what um, story was this? Um, just a lot of the stuff with, with lighting and imaging, uh, especially on like the older versions of phones, like they, when they would tune a picture to improve the quality, they didn't uh -huh. take it like skin color and stuff like that. Um, oh my gosh. There was a, uh, HP had like a printer or something uh, that would uh, recognize your face or whatever. Oh, really? But for African Americans, it didn't work, and they released the product, and it was just like yeah, totally embarrassing. But yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, so stuff like that. And you know, and I think um, actually at at a uh, UberConf was it Brian that said this that that Brian uh, yeah Brian uh, is it Sletton? Sletton. Um, um, but he was basically, you know, I think this is true. He's saying, you know, it sounds like Chef GPT sounds like I was trained by white males because everything it says is like super confident. <laughs> like it can be so wrong and just sound, you know, um, and I can see where right. he's coming from. Yeah. Brian Slinton uh, also said like uh, zip code, like if you have your input uh, and you train your model based on zip code, you already have bias. Like you're not, and Brian Slinton was uh, talking about this one hmm. that, you know, zip code. Uh, you know, we we have a long history, and that's the thing you need to know, like, especially if you're doing U.S. stuff, you need to know about U.S. history and about, like, uh, what was it called, keto, where, like, if you were a certain race, particularly if you're uh, Black or Hispanic, it was uh, steering, I think it was called. Um, and so, you know, a lot of cities would racially steer uh, people to get mortgages on a particular part of oh, town because you're that particular type of person and yeah. you should be a part of that town. Yeah. And if you don't know that history, you're already doing a bias, even though you don't mean to, because of your input zip code, you're injecting that bias without even knowing. Hmm. And there are a lot of those things that you have to think about. You have to be, it's kind of weird because I was always like, you know, whenever they said, oh, you need a well-rounded education to even become a programmer. I was like, what are you talking about? But now I realize even more so, you need to know a history of like where you're developing, uh, how people were treated in the past, why they're in this situation that they are in. Uh, there are a lot of different facets like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bias is a, is um, obviously a big issue in the certainly the the data engineering aspect of machine learning. Um, you know that's that's critically important. And I know that after teaching, you know, recently teaching a large class of, of uh, black students, I wanted to impress my students like you need to change the, the world. I mean, go out there and learn more as much as you can about machine learning because this is critically important. Um, there are also regulations um, in the financial world. When you create a model and you put it in production, you better document it properly <laughs> because there's a lot of, there's there's laws, there's there's uh, internal governance and, and, and these financial enterprises. So, because if you turn down a mortgage from say like a, a black couple, you better tell the, the, there better be good reasons why you did that, right? So um, there's a lot of laws, and these companies, since they are laws, they have to have uh, sophisticated uh, infrastructure around model deployment. Interesting, right? Interesting. So, so model risk is a huge thing that um, it's it's coming up in, in finance because it's regulatory, right? It's it's uh, it's legal stuff. But I think going forward, we're going to see a lot more. With model deployment and and risk management uh, as as applied to to model deployment for everything. 
Fascinating. Huh, okay. I, I hadn't thought about that for, but it, it makes sense for financial stuff. Um, yeah, well, the deployment of models, I mean, this is a big thing. We talk about models like, you know, as from a creating the, as developers, but to, when you deploy it, you have to document, you have to evolve these models. How do you evolve the models? How do you do QA and then the, all, all the stuff that you necessarily have to do to a production application, right? And this is no, this is no different. So it's it's not just like you just put a model in production, you're done. It's <laughs> it's a right. lot more involved. Right. Uh -huh. There's this uh, field uh, ML ops that is just you know begging for, mm. for people yeah. to join. Uh, how do you version? How do you catalog? Um, you know how do, uh, operationalizing machine learning models is right. is yeah. uh, absolutely tough. But uh, there's ML there's ML ops. Yeah, ML, and there's also yeah. ops ML. How do you use ML? What? And for general ops too, um, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense, that right? Because now you have we have cloud, right? Cloud is nothing but a programmable data center. So now, okay, how do we use these APIs in the data center and use ML to control the data center autonomously? Oh, right, <laughs> which to me is kind of scary, but uh, <laughs> but I, I I knew it would happen eventually, anyways. So. I think this podcast is making me scared, and I'm about to cry. <laughs> it's just so much to do and. To think about. No, no, we have now with ML, this Java Java developer should be happy. Now there's Java APIs for ML. Yes, yes. There's yeah. a JSR and then we have DeepNet's community edition. There's a lot of cool stuff happening. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Definitely. Okay, well, uh, we we exhausted lots of time here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think this we was like talked for... This was like an entire AI class that we just did. I know, <laughs> I know, which has been... <laughs> And now, now I want to go go use uh, the. I guess I guess if if it, here, here's a good question. So if I want if I'm a Java developer, I want to get started uh, working with uh, the uh, JSR 381. Um, how do I do it? You go to GitHub, uh, JSR 381, uh, and okay. start start from examples you have is getting started tutorial and uh, follow. And if you get stuck, feel free to write us. Okay, yeah. that's simple enough. We'll also put a link in the show notes, but I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so you can wins. Just, yeah. <laughs> so you can throw 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 the uh, dependency in your your Maven or Palm or your Gradle uh, file, and you're good to go. So, yes. Wonderful. Awesome. All right. So we will put that link in the show notes. Um, just so you know, you can find us online at Stack D Podcast. S T A C D S S T A C K D. <laughs> podcast.com there are two of them we're not a uh, we're not the construction company choose the other one no we're we're not you know we're not that cool so um all right so uh any other topics we want to bring up before i move on to the picks oh um just a uh, really quick uh frank uh since uh since you're part of the uh, new york java sig what uh what speakers do you have coming up hmm Oh well, we we just had this this week. We had a, a speaker talk about Netflix Conductor on on microservices, uh, you know, orchestration, which was fascinating. That was uh, really really cool. Um, the company Orcus is the they're the production version of the open source Netflix uh, library, and we had a big crowd for that, and that was uh, mind blowing. I mean, it's just uh, create these things and have it fully orchestrated and have a JSON thing generate for us that does orchestration. That was, that was phenomenal. Wow. That was crazy. That's but crazy. yeah, for, for, uh, August, we're taking our much needed break <laughs> from a month. What? Keep driving. What's wrong? <laughs> I, I know it's like, I know, but, but to make up for that in September, we have two of them. We have, um, the Java 21, of course, is going to be, you know, out in, in September. So we have a special meeting with uh, Oracle um, the second week of September. And then uh, we have Steve Poole at the end of the month from the UK talking about how Maven actually works. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what, um, and uh, maybe it's uh, too big of a question right now. I'm looking at uh, uh, JVK 21D. Uh, do does anyone know like what is absolutely coming up? Off the top of their head, I think a lot uh, of previews. Other than virtual threats, <laughs> yeah, it's LTS. Well, yes. well, we'll have to discuss that one a little bit later. Um, uh, one of yes. the uh, Oracle DevRels had a, a video on like how uh, LTS is not really LTS, and that caused uh, a little bit of firestorm there. Oh man, yeah, that was like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I get what they were saying, but yeah, uh, it, was, it was pretty. It, it's easy to confuse, and uh, but yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, 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 at one of the sessions last week, I, I was like, okay, what version of JDK are you on? And nobody was past 17. And I was like, you know, oh, you yeah. could use the other ones. It's okay. Do you buy support from Oracle? If you don't, it's production. No. It's really it's all there is to that. it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, I guess virtual threads, I, I got it here, but uh, virtual threads yeah. is going to be official. Right. It's already gone through the big three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. it's a, uh, let's see. Key encapsulation mechanism. Uh, record patterns is official. Generational oh. ZGC is, uh, and sequence collections are uh, official. Uh, preview string templates. I don't know if I like the look of it. What do all of you think? Have you seen uh, the JEP 430? Or string templates yet? Yeah, I you know I, I'm glad they're there, but honestly, it's so, so weird to have them without interpolation. <laughs> like I thought it did have interpolation, but that prefix character is the thing that throws me out. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't we, we need to probably study more, but yeah. Yeah. And uh, pattern matching for switch, I think, is official, which I'm really excited about. That is amazing. Uh because once you use records and you can actually you can destructure as long as you use records. I've tried that one out. That's a that's amazing. Nice, nice. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. How yeah, did we get so on we'll, here? But anyway, yeah, JDK twenty one. <laughs> yeah, JDK twenty one definitely a big deal. Uh, I'm so happy to see uh, virtual threads and a lot of the other stuff. Oh yeah, that one. Uh, I know where we got here. Frank said <laughs> uh, on September they're going to announce uh, twenty one. And uh, anything else for October there, Frank? Um. TBD for October. TBD, okay. Yeah. Cool. So one question, do you guys know, is uh, Panama in a final release in Java 21? Uh, Vector API is on sixth incubator. Taking mm -hmm. their time on that one. So you mentioned that one was Panama. Yeah. Um, what else so for, uh, more foreign API, this uh, link or API, yeah. Yeah, that's third preview on 21. Yeah. Oh, third preview. Oh, really? So it's not, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah you could use it on 21, but you have mm -hmm. to put that enable whatever flag that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We could use it, but nobody else will, right? <laughs> right, yeah. The, the ultra nerds <laughs> like us can use it, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. So, so, so what's your uh, opinion about uh, adoption of something like uh, Jao 20? How fast will it become, I don't know, Adopted. Uh, we're dragon. Yeah. This uh it moves too fast for the regular crowd, is what I think. Here's what uh, I think though is yeah, like number ahead. one, this is an LTS, which even though it's not important, it still helps, right? Um, and I mean the virtual yeah. thread stuff, some of the, and some of these other features are I think they're more compelling. So I'm hopeful that this will and also like if if for example let's say you've got a whole bunch of workloads microservices or just regular you know services in general running and your your underlying runtime now supports virtual threads and you know you can save money by upgrading maybe you will That's yeah. i don't yeah. know like if anything <laughs> i learned from the log4j shell is that <laughs> people don't upgrade that quickly and like, uh, they even are you had my... like the, you know, <laughs> right. they had this critical thing and it was just like you know just change out the library that's all you need to do no like uh, for a lot of places they were just like they had to do this process and it was i was like does even the world do ci cd like what's going on like could it just you know fix this and and move yeah. along but no that was hard so i i anticipate that uh, uh java has so one of my friends, which I think all of you uh, know, but I'm not going to name names, and the place he works, which I'm not going to name names, uh, he was mentioning to me that they had a vendor come over and uh, had had some software, and uh, but it only ran on JDK 7. And they were like, JDK 7? You know, that's, you know, that's, oh that's ancient. God. Oh, it's fine. And he convinced this big company that JDK 7 was fine. And they were like, okay. Like, what do you mean, okay? <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So, These things happen. What do you think? Uh, uh, how could we get data to uh, create a model that will predict uh, the adoption of the newly released <laughs> JDK? Yeah, that's right. I, I bet there's a simple uh, X Y formula plot that we could just do. And, no, uh, no, no. There's no formula. 
but we need a model, you know. So we are we right. predict based functional based on the features. What are the features upon which companies organization decide when they are going to adopt? You know. Yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, I I wouldn't even know how to like even train that yeah. model because like. Peter said that like virtual threads would probably be the thing that pulls people over to 21, but is that good? So enough? it's a performance improvement, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, but if still... you put, put them in general categories, you know, and it's a performance yeah. risk, uh, cost, uh, benefits, mm -hmm. you know. I'm it's... surprised developers don't have that much power is, is the other surprising thing. Well, like, also, I text don't blocks, think it. text blocks should have just done it like text box you know developers yes. would have been like oh this yes. is going to save me a bunch of time yeah, uh yes. records are going to save me a bunch of time productivity, like productivity would have been, right yeah what's that productivity productivity yeah, yeah. Right. productivity like the developers have should categories. have moved this along yeah right yeah but they haven't i don't think they have that much power yeah in the end okay so no, think about know. it maybe we, we start yeah. like a special dedicated session in one of your next episodes and get on to it to to, to <laughs> see. <laughs> do what we can do. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. I I what did oh yes I I do have my notes here. Okay. All right. Let's 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 jump over to the picks. Um. I've got a, a simple. Um. Actually, I I had two picks, but I forgot the other one. I'll I'll have to add it next time. All right. So um, my pick is Antora. Um, and I may have mentioned this in, on the last Fine episode, choice. but um, I can't remember exactly. Uh, so, um, Antora is a tool for uh, helping, uh, for basically writing documentation, which which hopefully isn't completely obsolete yet. Um, but uh, basically, uh, it builds on top of ASCII doc, which is a, um, uh, it's it's like a much better version of Markdown, a more complete version of Markdown. Um, Gauntlet is thrown. And uh, and basically, <laughs> Antora lets you uh, build out a whole documentation site and then um, also build it from different Git repos um, and have different versions for components and things like that. Um, and um, it's uh, one of the key developers is Dan Allen, who worked a lot on Seam and Red Hat a long time ago. Um, right. That's how I met him. Um, and he also is one of the reasons that a lot of the, the docs that we see use ASCII doc is because um, Dan wrote ASCII doctor, which is actually in Ruby. Um, yeah. And Tor is actually written in JavaScript. Don't ask me why he chose JavaScript, but it's still a great tool. Um, so uh, anyway, so if, if you if you build documentation sites, you might want to take a look at it. It's got a lot of a lot of open source companies or organizations use it. So You're going to be creating a lot of repos because uh, I tried it out. But the genius, one of the geniuses is like, if you create a module, let's say, let's say we're all creating a module on like Java collections and, you know, we're creating a, uh, a class, you know, uh, class materials for a beginning Java and an intermediate Java. And we want to use uh, intermediate or uh, we want to use Java collections mo as a module. Uh, each module you can make into a, a separate Git repository and then cross-reference that and you have it on both sides. So. Mm -hmm. um, you could design things, you know, very neatly, but you're going to have a lot of repositories. But I think that's cool. Yeah. All right, Frank, uh, you want to tell us? Uh, so we have here. I think you already yeah, talked so, about it, but uh, OpenAI Java. Right. So, so um, OpenAI has only offers a Python um, interface, direct interface. Um, so it's a REST. Of course, it's a REST service. So um, they. They're relying on the community to come up with the different language bindings. And the one that they recommend is this one from this gentleman, Theo Canning. So um, when I first was learning about this stuff, I decided to like, let me find out who has a Java API. And of course, there's a whole bunch of them out there already. And I tried a bunch of them. And they're all um, pretty simple and they're very easy to use. But most of them have this problem that they don't cover the entire API set of OpenAI. So if you wanted to create a more specific, uh, you know, use the low level embeddings, you know, you want to create uh, a chat on top of your own doc set, your own corpus of data, like your work for enterprise and you want to create a chat on top of your stuff. Well, you need an ac you need access to the embeddings API, not just to the, the chat uh, in interface, but embeddings. Well, most of them don't cover that API, but Theo has, he's covered the entire API set. So uh, I would suggest starting with that one. It's not it's not as simple as the other ones, 
but it's not that hard to learn. It's, 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 right. you can pick it up a little. It's, uh, and it, but it covers the entire doxet. So I, I would recommend checking out that. Wonderful. And cool. Right. And uh, Zoran, uh, why should we uh, reinvest in Apache Groovy? We've used it in the past. Uh, why should we yeah. take another look at it? Well, because Apache Groovy can uh, uh, provide a Python uh, feel, uh, look and feel for coding uh, for machine learning uh, on Java. You know, uh, it, it's like a scripting uh, language that can you can create domain specific language and you can use existing library Java libraries in in, in uh, Groovy. So when I uh, started looking at it. Uh, there were some examples uh, I found on Twitter. Some somebody created from the Apache Groovy community, uh, benchmarking these um, different deep learning engines, including deep nets. And I was really uh, amazed how nicely it looks, and it lo it looks and feels just like Python. And you, uh, from a perspective of ease of use, and you have all the benefits of Java. You know, yep. so Beautiful if you ask, me, yes. Yes, I, I will say um, I, I it, Groovy is something that it's like if you're in the Java ecosystem, you just kind of run into occasionally, right? And yeah, and I I, I really love writing um, uh, Jenkins pipelines uh, because mm -hmm. they've got a great DSL, and then if you want to jump to the actual, if you want to jump down by Jenkins group, pipelines by itself, it's one of the reasons why GitHub listed as a pop uh, as one of the most popular languages. I think really? that's a, the, one of the biggest reasons why it's that, that makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. Much better for pipelines than YAML, if you ask me. Oh, that's right. <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay, here we go. Keto, go to this website, Worldle. All right, Worldle is like Wordle, except you get a uh, you get a silhouette of a country that you have to guess. So we're going to have Keto play one here, and uh, guess what country that is. And we'll give you a hint here in a bit. Oh my God! Seriously. What country is that? You know, you have I, like six see, guesses, I think. See, I, I, I would, I would Here's actually show my not, screen, you're love this it's, game. it's a little too embarrassing. <laughs> All right, here, I'll give you a clue. Yeah. Zoran lives there. Just <laughs> <laughs> type in Serbia real quick here. Yeah. Hey, I got it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, uh, my other pick, I have four picks, so you got to deal, deal with me on these uh, next four. Uh, so Frank was saying, um, uh, I think you were mentioning something. I'd like to know where things are deprecated. I'm sure you knew this one already, but Java Almanac is awesome. Have that bookmarked. Uh, just do a Google search on Java Almanac. You will not live without it. I think there's a Java champion that wrote all this. I forgot who it was, but just a terrific job. Uh, and I don't know if I talked about this in a previous podcast, but if you're a Java developer, this is the only bookmark you need. <laughs> I actually have never uh, been could, here. You've never been there. Oh, I have Frank, not. did you know about this? No, I did not. What is going on? Zoran, did you know about the Java Almanac? No, no. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Java Almanac IO. All right. Mark so Hoffman here's the cool thing. Shows all the Java details. Um, shows the status, dev, EOL, LTS. All the API docs are there. The language specs are there, the VM, the notes, uh, how you download it, and you can download from here. Of course, I use SDK, man. But my favorite thing, you ready, Frank? Frank's gonna be like, oh, is that matrix that you see there compared to yeah. whatever. So you could say like Java 20, let's do Java 21, and compare the APIs to 17, or any one of those. And that will get you everything that you desire. This is awesome. <laughs> wow. So it would, show, cool. it would show all the deprecations, show what's removed, uh, what uh, modifiers have been added, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. This yeah. is awesome. I could yeah. mention uh, uh, similar things. Uh, are you familiar with FooJ? Yes. FooJ.io, yeah. I think I'm yes, a member yeah. as well. I just got added yeah. on this year. They have these uh, release details, but uh, maybe like um, even better interface for filtering stuff, you know. Oh, wonderful. Okay. FooJ.io. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. I need to use I, the research. I dropped you a, a link with OpenJDK update and release details. Oh, so yeah. you can 
filter the these versions and uh, you know compare it. I guess yes. Like it. Pilots, components, security patches, and everything else. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. So it's just a bunch of HTML files to you know. Cool. I, like it. I love it. Yeah. Nice. All right. Okay, Java Almanac. Uh, my uh, other one, I did a uh, IntelliJ workshop over at UberConf, and um, IntelliJ, as, as well as like a lot of editors as well, but IntelliJ has multi cursors. Uh, it's usually like Alt Shift or uh, yeah, Alt Shift and click, and then you can put cursors wherever you want and start to edit however you want. Uh, but you can add carrots uh, to the end of each line. And so that means if you make a text selection and then you do uh, well, on Mac, it's option uh, shift and G, it'll just put all the characters at the end of the line. So if you need to append things at the end of you know every line, uh, then you could do so. I think that's a that's a wonderful uh, that's a wonderful time saver. I'm going to go ahead and put that on here, uh, and there it is on the chat. So uh, if you're an IntelliJ user and you just you want multi cursors at the end of the line, uh, you know someone asked that question during my presentation. I'm like I don't know, <laughs> and we looked it up, and <laughs> lo and behold, they have it. Yeah, so that, that's cool because I. I knew there were some multiple cursor support, but I never could remember how to do it. And I never spent enough. I never spent time figuring out how. So. Right, right. So this is uh, and then my last pick is in Firefox, uh, just because I was doing financials. And you know, financials are like usually HTML tables. And sometimes I just want to select, you know, a small section of the table. Maybe I want to select a column. Maybe I want to select three columns. Uh, Firefox has that. Chrome, I don't think Chrome has it. And so if you're on a Mac, uh, bring up anything that has an HTML table and then hold your, uh, on a Mac, it's a super key. I think it's probably the Alt key or Control key on Windows. Uh, but if you if you hold and you go to something with an HTML table, hold on to your uh, super key or your Mac key uh, and then start to highlight uh, columns or whatever. Vertical selection is, is another way to call it. Very cool. So if you never need to take a bunch of data really quick, um, and you don't want to manually type, that's the way to go. All right, and then that's it. <laughs> All right. Very nice. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up, um, if you like this podcast, uh, you can check out other ones on the Pubhouse network. There's Offheap and Java Pubhouse. You can find them both in your favorite uh, podcast app. Um, and a few events coming up. Uh, DevOps Ukraine is coming up uh, on September 22nd, and and that is online only, but I thought it was really nice to see the, them still doing it, um, given all the stuff going on there. Um, we'll, we'll put the uh, links to the, the New York Java SIG chats that will be coming up uh, in September. Um, Oracle Cloud World, uh, September 18th through 20th in Vegas. Um, there is no Java one there, so I don't think you'll be seeing us there, but um, but but Oracle Cloud World is there. And I think they do have some Java talks and lots of other, you know, Oracle talks as well. Yeah. Uh, and Jax London, October 2nd through 5th in London. Um, I'll I heard uh, there's a Jax New York. Do you know anything about that, Frank? I haven't. I, have, I haven't heard. No, I haven't heard at all. Okay. All right. Come on. That would be interesting because they they tried the U.S. market many years ago and then yeah out, it didn't so. hold but they need to be more persistent if they're wanting to do that yeah yeah um, anyway so that's October second through fifth and that'll be my first time there in probably like a decade I think um, DevOx Belgium October second through uh, six in Antwerp Belgium and uh you want to want to go for the uh no fluff uh yeah show? we got uh we're uh doing our circus <laughs> or traveling road show once again uh so new england uh close to boston uh september 22nd 24th uh columbus ohio september 29th and october 1st uh nova uh where we're at reston near the airport uh october 13th through 14th uh minneapolis uh october 20th and 21st Salt Lake City, November 3rd and 4th. And then in Florida in December, you know, in case it gets cold around your area, um, DevOps Division, uh, December 4th through 6th in Florida, Tech Leader Summit, 6th through 8th, 
Uh, this new thing here, kind of interesting, DevRel experience, <laughs> December 6th or 8th. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of talks would uh, end up there, but hey, different <laughs> different facet, I guess. And then uh, Architecture Conf, uh, December 11th, 14th. Those last four that I mentioned are in uh, Florida, where it will be warm in December. Yeah, and they're in, they're in Clearwater this time. Clearwater, right? Florida. Yeah, which is nice. All right. Well, um, I think that leads us to the end of another Stack D podcast. I said I like the way you say it better, Dana. Yeah. Well, how do I call D. it? Stack D stack sounds D. cooler than stacked. So. Oh wow! I didn't know I was supposed to say it that way. I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. I. I. You, the other last week you said, and I was like, you know, I think that sounds cooler. Oh, um, by the way, a quick AI question. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, okay, Frank, how do you pronounce E P O C H? How do you pronounce it as an American? Epic. E Epic. Epic. Okay. Uh, Zoran, how do you uh, pronounce that? E P O C H. Epoch. 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 I know. Epoch. Okay. Epoch. Yes. All right. And it was just a, it was just something that uh, we're supposed to think about. Yeah. 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 That you that. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, there's the thing. This uh, machine learning terminology, and uh, if we, we we would say iteration, then everybody would understand, right? Training iteration. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's the training about, iteration like, when training a model. Yes. Yeah, you were talking about pronunciations and like AI. I was doing an AI thing. I was like, yeah, we ran through uh, multiple epics, and they were like, really? Like books, like Star Wars, or what? And I'm like, no <laughs> epics. Epics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, stack D. Yes. yes. Stacked or stack D. So, uh, yeah, so thanks a lot, Frank and Zorns. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank awesome. you, guys. Yeah, yeah, thank, yeah, thanks, guys. This episode has been a long time in the making, so we're glad we were able to get finally get everybody yeah. together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I, I think I think we, we should have you guys back next year to see how things are going. Like, yeah, so sure, very, definitely. Where are things going? That would awesome. be great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, listening, and uh, you will find us next time um, on, on the uh, podcast apps and on YouTube. <laughs> Thanks. That's good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Bye. Bye. bye.